welcome to the cutting room, New York City. I'm Brad Talinsky with Backstory Events, and this evening's show is going to be live streamed on guitarworld.com, uh, where it will remain forever and ever, so uh, behave yourself. Um, future Backstory Events include uh, an evening, a really cool birthday bash with metal jazz guitar legend Alex Skolnick. But uh, this evening we have with us, uh, I think, one of the great American pop songwriters. Uh, you know him from great songs like uh, On and On and Save It for a Rainy Day, Academy Award nominated, uh, Separate Lives. Uh, all the guitar fans out there might know him as one of Eric Clapton's favorite songwriters. Uh, but today we're here to talk to uh, him about his new record. We'll talk about it later in the car. Um, let's bring out Mr. Stephen Bishop. It's a glass yeah. of water. <laughs> Hello. Just flew in, you know, from England. Not really. <laughs> Your arms aren't tired? No, no, they're fine. Um, <laughs> so the genesis of this record was really intriguing to me. Could you tell us a bit about, uh, you know, where this record started? Well, it, uh, you know, I've done a lot of albums now, and uh, usually um, I wait till I have the songs, you know, uh, and um, in this case, it was kind of different because I was going through all these different um, songs that I had written uh, back in the olden days of uh, On and On and Save For Any Day and my early album like Careless and all the songs that I, I almost put on that. And, and then I started just working it and just, you know, rewriting some and, and uh, I decided to re-record a lot of these songs. So like One in a Million Girl is... is uh, totally a re, uh, you know re-recorded thing and uh, and a lot of the songs are and then some new songs and you know the uh, I, I I very rarely cover other people's uh, songs but I in this case I did I did with uh, I, I recorded Jimmy Webb's song um, that he wrote when he was 12 this first song uh, called uh, someone else and uh, I worked on that and uh, that was on the album and also, um, a friend of mine, um, uh, Billy London, uh, wrote this song that was about dreams. And uh, I had one dream. Uh, some people like have these dreams where they just, you know, uh, they fly all the time. He says, oh yeah, I flew last night, no big deal. But for me, I had this one dream where I was kind of in a depression and then I came out of it and I flew and it was like, wow. And so I wanted to do a song about that. And I, I have that, that second called In Dreams I Fly. Uh, and, then, um, and then I did an old Peggy Lee song, which I love, uh, which you, you just heard, hopefully. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I just decided to work on my album, a new album. So uh, what was it like listening to uh, your younger self? Were you okay? My younger self? Yeah, the, the, the early demos for the record. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you know it's all one, it's all one. <laughs> <laughs> it's all me, you know, it's, it's, you know, I've been writing songs since I was about 14. Yeah. So um, some terrible songs, you know, I mean, to, to be honest, you know, like songs like There's a Hair in Your Enchilada and Beer Can on the Beach and She Took, my quum, she took All My Kumquats and... I mean, these are real songs with a bridge and the whole thing, you know, I mean, terrible song. Uh, you know, Will There Ever Be a Sunday in Nebraska? That was a big one. And just, you know, uh, weird, weird things like that. They sound pretty good to me, I think. Do they really? Oh, no. <laughs> I, I would like to hear all those songs. Oh, really? Oh, no, you don't want to hear them, believe me. I had one song called Dump the Spittoon Over Aunt Natty's Head. I was like, what? How could I write that? And there was this whole song about Aunt Natty, you know, whoever, whoever that was. So I just was really into these kind of crazy. And then when I got a, a publishing deal, 
uh, there was this, the main guy at the publishing company was this old guy named Sidney Goldstein. And he was like, I was like 18 and, you know, really proud of, you know, songs like There's a Hair in Your Enchilada. And he was like, what am I going to do? Am I going to take this to share? What are we, you know, the fifth dimension isn't going to do There's a Hair in Your Enchilada, you know, and all this, you know. When did you uh, when did you move out of that phase? Do you remember? Was there a song that was sort of a breakthrough that you're like, okay, I'm going to leave all this sort of kid stuff behind and start singing about real things? Well, you know, I always say, you know, to songwriters, I always say, you're not going to ever be a really good songwriter unless you get your heart broken, and that seems to be the criterion, you know, that really is true. You got to get your heart broken, and then you feel, and you can describe how your feelings and being sincere, that's what I always tried to do with my songs, you know, is be sincere and sing like you're sincere about something, you know. And um, yeah, I think that's the end of the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said like you're sincere. Like you're sincere, <laughs> not that you are sincere. <laughs> Um, I, the, you know, the title of the album is, is really interesting, too. We'll talk about it later in the car. Yeah. Where did that come from? Well, uh, we'll talk about it later in the car. That actually came from, uh, I've been saying that line in concert for years and years, because it's a great line to um, end a sentence, you know? Like, uh, yeah, I, I was climbing this uh, rhino in Kenya, and uh, anyway, we'll talk about it later in the car, you know. <laughs> so uh, it came from, actually, uh, of all things, it came from Carrie Fisher. Because uh, in the, in the mid-70s, I, you know, I, I knew her, and she was the greatest. And uh, uh, we wound up um, uh, going to Saturday Night Live one time, and uh, she went in a little booth and she was talking to somebody on the phone, and then I overheard her say, we'll talk about it later in the car. And so I thought, oh, she's talking about me. I, I did something weird, there's nothing, I don't know what. And then when she came out of the booth, I, I said, oh, is that about me? We'll talk about it later in the car. She said, no, 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 that was what my, her mother, Debbie Reynolds, would say to her when they had an argument or something. You know, we'll talk about it later in the car. So I've been just using that line and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to, and people really like this title. I, I don't even understand why they like it, but, you know, it is what it is. From uh, all reports, she was a, a supremely sort of entertaining human being. Do you have any good Carrie Fisher stories to, to share you know, with us? You know, I, I just remember that she could sing, you know, she could do impressions like you wouldn't believe. I mean, she... She did it, she could sing like Judy Garland, it sounded like Judy Garland. I mean, she, she was one of the most talented people I've ever, I've ever met. Yeah. Um, was she frustrated with the Princess Leia thing? Well, we didn't, we weren't that heavy. Uh, you know, I did, didn't get into Star Wars and stuff, you know. <laughs> have, you like, have to, you have to ask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't go there. No, not really. Mm -hmm. I, of course, it's a while ago, so I'm... I don't even remember. Well, there are some uh, fantastic songs on this album. I recommend everybody go out and get it right away. And uh, uh, one of my favorites is uh, the first single off of it, Like Mother, Like Daughter. Um, terrific song. Can you tell us about uh, sort of the genesis of that? Well, I wrote it with um, this uh, great writer, uh, Robin Lerner. Uh, she co-wrote This Kiss by Faith Hill, and she's done a lot of stuff. Uh, she and I just hunkered down and just uh, worked on it like you got to do when you write a song. You don't just casually write it. You have to really concentrate and uh, put some effort in it. And uh, so it was a different thing because I, I'm very proud of the song because so many songs on the radio are about love, love, and all the beautiful things about love. And, and this is a, di a different thing about love. It's about family love and uh, all the different problems that, that happen in a family. And you know, how many songs on the radio are about family? You haven't heard, probably heard it since Sly and the Family Stone. Um, does that it does, make sense? <laughs> it, it, uh, it's or, a family affair. Remember that song? 
We are family. There's some. There's a there's yeah. a few of those out there. Yeah. Um, but it has a country vibe to it. It does. Uh, it does. And uh, is that something that you're into? Do you like contemporary country music, or is this uh, just betraying some folk roots? Or you know, to be honest, I don't really like contemporary <laughs> country music. I like like. Uh, for example, I like old, uh, like country and western, like uh, I got Spurs that jingle, 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 and and you know Eddie Arnold, uh, you know Cattle Call and stuff like that, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, weird songs like that. But I like you know more like uh, country and western. Yeah, Hank Williams. Hank He's Williams, good. Yeah. great. Yeah. Um, another song that I really loved off the record is towards the end of it actually uh french postcards oh <laughs> and uh the opening line is awesome it's they never uh they never pick the miss america you think should win right right and then somehow they, we get to paris after that but they never pick the miss america you think should win and here in paris and then all of a sudden i'm here in paris i'm like the whole paris thing I'd never even been to Paris when I wrote that song, <laughs> or, or France, you know. And, and then I talk about all these French references. Yeah, but but where where did that line come from, and how did you think of making that shift from being in a, a, such an American centric thing to being in Paris? Well, you know, uh, I wasn't doing anything else, so. I thought <laughs> I thought I would. I mean, that first line, uh, they never picked the Miss America you think she win. That was just, you know, I just wrote it. No, I thought of, I thought of it. I thunked of it. Yeah. But they, but they never do pick the ones that... They never do. You always go, you should have picked the other one, that girl next to her. When is the crucial time to pick the Miss America you think should win? Like, what process does that uh, come for you in the Miss America pageant? Um... Well, I don't like usually it? watch it, so I don't know. You know. I can't really be, you know, give you a whole thing on Miss well, America. Well, you know, like, do you wait until they, they answer the questions, or is it like an immediate, like, attraction thing? Well, you know, I, I just remember my mother used to sit there and watch the Miss America pageant, and I swear to God, she just... When they picked the the girl and she was you know Miss America and she'd walk down the thing with the roses and there and that guy Bert Parks would was it Bert Parks he would Man, there she is Miss America my mom would just cry like a river <laughs> you know and I just go what how corny what are you doing you know and then I you know later on in life I'd be seeing some movie that was just animated or something and then I'd be <laughs> you know, carrying on her great tradition. <laughs> so in that song, you're checking out French girls that, right. uh, and then, but you're thinking about like some girl in America. Doesn't seem like you've got a shot at either one of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that also the essence of songwriting is unrequited love? And hope, yeah. I think, you know. And unrequited love is big, yeah. It's a good theme. It's really a good theme. You know, I know. Or requited love, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is sort of a. I noticed like a, a a bit of a vague theme on the record of there's sort of a restless nostalgia. You know, like you're trying to move forward, but you're thinking about the past, and even in the songs themselves. You know, you're you're picking things from the past. You're moving forward. I, I mean, it all sort of comes together for me on that song, "Almost Home," which oh. is like trying to reach your destination, you know, but never maybe getting there. Yeah, yeah. That's actually "Almost Home." Uh, the first song on the album is is uh, the theme to Benji, this new Benji, new and improved Benji. <laughs> And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's on Netflix, uh, you know, it, it was this whole thing. We were hoping it would be, a, you know, we'd get nominated or something for it, but, the, you know, Netflix wouldn't get behind it too much. So, um, you know, but it's on there still. And, um, you know, the song was just about Benji getting home. And, but it really, uh, the lyrics are for, you know, anything like people, you know, soldiers coming home from the war or, you know, just wanting to get home, you know. 
Well, you've, you've, uh, you've written uh, several great theme songs for movies. Uh, uh, Separate Lives was nominated for Academy Award and um, you know several others. And I, I was sort of wondering about that songwriting process. Is that, I mean, do you watch the film, do you think about it in, in that way or do you say, oh, I've got a song that fits that feeling of that movie? I mean, no, how usually you, you write to the movie, you know, you either get a script or you, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I've done a lot of different films and uh, like with Animal House, they gave me a script and then I just incorporated all the characters' names in the song. Uh, Babs and Mandy have her in pillow fight, you know, and all that stuff for Animal House. It was all, it was, it was, it, the movie was set in 1962, so it, it, it just, you know, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons were huge uh, in 62, so I thought that would be the, the way to go. So I did that high thing, which you don't want to get stuck with that. <laughs> you know what I think the funniest bit about that song is? Is when it goes, do the Bluto, do the Bluto. Do the Bluto, do the Bluto. And then, Stan, uh, 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 Belushi was Bluto. Yes. And then you do it again, like this thing that's sort of dumb and then it repeats, it cracks me up every right, time. Right. Oh, good. <laughs> well, yeah, that's um, one of the ones we How long we did do. it take you to write that song? Actually, like an afternoon, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, and I, usually songs take forever for me. Um, but that song, Animal House, I pretty much wrote it uh, just sitting there on the rug, you know, in my uh, uh, Laurel Canyon home. <laughs> Um, on the recording, it sounded like the recording was fun. Like, where did you get all the background hoots and hollers? Well, I that? did some of those background. You know, yeah. Yeah, I, there's all sorts of stuff. If you hear uh, the recording of Animal House, there's at the very end, there's just all sorts of weird, weird uh, uh, things that I, uh, I, you know, I'm like singing, you know, do the blue doll, do it right now. And do the Chris Montez imitation for me now. <laughs> you know, I was doing Chris Montez, you know, let's dance or whatever the song he used to do. Lightning Strikes. Yeah, no, that's uh, the other guy. That's oh, Luke sorry, Christie. Another guy with a high yeah, voice. Yeah, that's okay. Um, is there any like backward masking that we should know about, like satanic messages or anything in the background? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. Being a Beatles fan, I thought maybe you worked no. something like that. No, there's just you know they 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 put in clips of the movie, you know, uh, from various characters in the film at the very end, you know. Um, I can't remember it now because I have no brain, but um, something like that. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> um, you did mention earlier that uh, on this record you recorded a Jimmy Webb song. Yeah. And it is a lovely song. Um, you know, what inspired you to, to, to pick that particular tune? Well, to be honest, it's like, you know, Art Garfunkel recorded it years and years ago. He did a different kind of a version. Uh, and I like his version, but mine is kind of more sad and lonely and you know I had something happen to me when I was in high school I was I had a, a you know a high school romance with uh, this girl named Claudia Higgins and one day in math class I decided to go out and see her in the lunch quad and she was in the arms of this guy named Brad Bright and they were making out and I was like totally crushed <laughs> and I was like oh and then I go to her locker, uh, to her, um, her, her um, you know, and I, I knew her combination. So I go to her locker and I open the locker and I, I see this nifty notebook binder of hers. And the first line is, Brad, I think Steve's on to us. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I think that should be the title for your next record. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So, you know, I was like, and she was like, you know, no, I didn't do it. She, she, she said she didn't do anything and she was fine, you know. But, uh, you know, I had to take Polaroids. No, I know she was. <laughs> but I learned a lesson back then. Yes. 
Um, I'm curious, as, uh, as a great songwriter, could you name three songs by other people that you think are great? Not, not the best songs of all time, but just three songs that you think are really Three great. songs? Yes. Well, I'm, I got two songs in my head right now. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah. OK, well, I, I'll say um, the song by Tim Moore called Second Avenue. I thought that was an amazing song. Do you know that song? I mean, he, he talks about it snowing, and he writes in the snow. And I thought he was, you know, as a songwriter, you always kind of predict what people are going to write about, or even chords. And you know, you go, oh, they're going to go here, and the lyric is going to go here. And then it really surprised me, because instead of him saying, I love you, he put in the snow, I am you. Where I wrote, I am you, on 2nd Avenue. So I thought that was really brilliant. And um, also, I Am the Wal Walrus uh, by the Beatles. I just love that song. It's an amazing song. I mean, to write that song must have been incredible. But I love I Am the Walrus. And I guess, you know, uh, there's so many songs by Randy Newman that I think are brilliant. Um, I even named my new puppy Randy Newman. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, he's just so incredible, and I guess Marie would be would be like you know his song Marie from his album Good Old Boys, which is one of my favorite albums. Could you imagine ever writing something like Stairway to Heaven? Um, like a weird sort of just. Like I guess so, but you know the the chord pattern is really good in Stairway to Heaven. I've just never been a big I, you know, I shouldn't say this you know, but I've never been a big Robert Plant fan. As far as back then, I always thought it sounded like an old woman who was like, and I lay, I, you know, and it's just like, oh no. So I shouldn't say that. That's wrong. Wrong of me to say. But uh, he, he just, it ne I never really thought that they came close to the Beatles where I just adored, you know, a, a Paul McCartney's voice and uh, John Lennon's voice. Yeah, I mean, it's more rooted in reality. The Beatles could get surreal like that, you know, but. Oh, well, the Beatles were just, I mean, so adventurous. If you think of it, you know, how many groups or even acts are there that where you know almost every song? you know, over like, you know, 10 albums or how many albums they had. I mean, I know all those, their songs. Sort of weird when I was- And the Stones, you're right, the Stones. And I love the Stones and they're great songwriters. You're right, you're right. I see your point and it must be hard to find a hat for it, but that's a <laughs> different situation. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, the Stones, she's right, the Stones. When I was uh, doing some research for this interview, and I knew you were a Beatles fan, I was thinking, I know a song that, that Stephen would like, Another Day by Paul McCartney. That seems like, eh, no? It was all right. Not a great song. Really? I, thought, I think that's a terrific it's song. It's another day. It's a little bit, you know. Oh. It has that if melancholy If I blow away, vibe. look out. OK, OK. I don't know. It's a little bit, uh, it, it didn't have the, I mean, McCartney has written, you know, amazing songs. I mean, Eleanor Rigby, and uh, I mean, uh, really amazing stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, <laughs> do you have any personal uh, rules for songwriting, like, you know, it, this thing's got to have a great bridge, or or things before you deem that this is a good song? Oh uh, well. What I like to do is when I write a new song, I like to play it for a lot of my friends. So I get kind of a poll of uh, where it's at. You know, uh, usually I get an idea if it's a good song, it's the bad song. Uh, from my friends, you know, I like to do that. Um, but like I said before, until you've gotten your heart broken, you're not going to be a great songwriter, I think, you know. So. I mean, will your friends tell you the truth about uh, your usually, songs? Usually, usually, yeah. 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 They're like, yeah. nah, Stephen, that's no good. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, to take a little uh, trip back to the, to the 70s for selfish reasons, mm. uh, I think, you know, like a lot of the music that came out of uh, West Coast, Los Angeles, 
got criticized for being too slick. Um, but I thought some of these records are the most beautiful records ever recorded. I what mean, era are you talking about? I'm talking about sort of the mid-70s. Oh. You know, they call it Yacht Rock or whatever they want to call it. And oh. Careless definitely is one of those really, really beautiful sounding right. albums. That's nice. Thank you. And uh, I was wondering, what was it about that period? Was it the players? Was, was it the recording studios? What, what was able to generate these beautiful sounding records from that era? Well, I mean, I, I just uh, had all these, you know, same kind of deal in a way as this new album in that I just collect my own songs until it's time to make an album. And then I did that back then. Um, you know, I had conflict because uh, I had uh, a, a guy there, uh, Roy Halley, that I, I started off with, who's one of the great producers of all time. He, he, he produced uh, the Simon and Garfunkel records, and he signed me, actually, to uh, the record company back then. Uh, but I wanted to use this uh, keyboard player of mine named John Jarvis, and he wanted to use another keyboard player. And so we, we had a parting of the ways, and uh, he wound up getting me Henry Louie, who had done all the Joni Mitchell records. And so I, you know, I was off with uh, Henry Louie, and then uh, we co-produced my first album. Um, you know, your first few records are covered with some of the, uh, an astonishing assortment of, of musicians. Uh, Lee Rittenauer, Eric Clapton, Larry Carlton, Tommy Tedesco, Jim Gordon, Russ Kunkel, Shaka Khan, Art Garfunkel, Steve Cropper. I mean, this Dave is... Fos David Foster. These are some of the greatest musicians of all time. And, and no offense to you, but how did this uh, young punk get all these great people to, to play on his record? Well, I was, you know, it's also not, not just me, it's just the producers, too. Uh, with Roy Halley, he knew all these great musicians, Larry Nechtel, and we did about four songs just the, the, you know, and worked on those before I went ahead to work with Henry Louis. Um, you know, there was different uh, things that happened. For example, on my first album, uh, we, we did a song called Little Italy. Little Italy, I stopped probably doing, saying it. Little Italy. <laughs> Uh, I actually wrote the song because I saw the title in a newspaper and it just said Little Italy. And I thought, oh, that sounds great. Little Italy, Little Italy. And so I wrote this whole concept and this whole thing about Little Italy. So then I thought, I know just who's going to play on it. This guy named Emmett Chapman. He plays an electric stick. And it's like this big stick with notes on it. And it's like, <laughs> or something, I had heard about it, and I thought this was gonna be great. And he came in the studio, and it was just a disaster. It just, <laughs> it just, <laughs> I was like, what, oh my God. And uh, so I thought, you know, I said to Henry Louis, what are we gonna do? And, and he said, well, I don't know, uh, let's call Larry Carlton. <laughs> and so we called Larry, Larry Carlton, he came in, he played a complimentary guitar part, and there you go. Uh, it went great. Yeah. Um, you know, we all know the, the song On and On. I always had a question about that in my mind. I would listen to it, and, you know, the opening lines are about the, you know, these beautiful Jamaican women, and then all of a sudden it, it moves all of a sudden to another scene, and then another scene, and then another scene. And I'm still wondering about the beautiful Jamaican women, but yeah, maybe right, that's just right. me. But <laughs> um, I was curious about the songwriting process for that song. Like when you were thinking of it, you, you know, did you want to show these different scenarios and how did that evolve? Well, you know, I, with my lyric writing, I always try and just keep the listener interested. You know, uh, it, too many songs say, and I saw you there and you were great and you know it just doesn't i like to use imagery and you know in and on and on there's a lot of that you know puts on sinatra and starts to cry you know i've had people walk up to me in, in a supermarket go i love that line you know and it was like great yeah. uh 
Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, that's about, what, I just blanked. What, what were we talking about? <laughs> Well, well, just the shift. I woke up early, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pushing my album. <laughs> we were talking about the, the the shift between different scenes in this one song. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it just you know I just want to make it interesting, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's about it. Make it interesting. <laughs> I, I, I guess um, another big song from that first record, say for a rainy day. Yeah. So, Great up tempo, power pop song. I, I I just love it. But the thing that made me curious is so, you get Eric Clapton to play on it, and uh, Eric at that time, I mean, he still is one of the greatest players. But but then he was an absolute god that was walking the earth. One of the and you give him only like four bars, and then you sweep him off. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he says the same thing. You know. He says, I don't get it, you know. I mean, you bring me in there, and I just did a little bit, you know. Yeah, you, you have a, a xylophone sort of takeover. For yeah, I had a xylophone, but then Roy Halley said, no, keep the lead guitar going. So, uh, you know, he had heard it, and he thought, you know, he helped to make it a hit, actually. But, um, yeah, well, it was just a weird thing. It was like um, I had a manager back then who invited Eric and his then-girlfriend, Patty Boyd, to show up at the studio, and then I was a funny guy, and or something like that, and they wound up showing up, and uh, you know, uh, he wound up, you know, they got this little amp, and uh, I should have had this big, you know, solo or something, but you know, I was trying to be Hitley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, sort of Eric's gone on to become an almost an Alfred Hitchcock figure on your records. He does, he's does. he got little cameos sort of all over the place. He's played on a, on a few albums of mine, Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. Um, the one I was interested in was uh, Sex Kittens Go to College. Oh, yeah, Sex Kittens Go to College. Um, don't clap for that, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't deserve it. It really doesn't. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I wrote this crazy song. I was in England, and uh, I wanted to record, you know, with them and everything. And so, you know, Phil Collins played drums, and Eric played the guitar, and I had great musicians like um, uh, who's the guy uh, Gary? Uh, he he's, he's the sing Gary Brooker, uh, who was the singer in uh, Procol Harum, and you know, had all these cool people play. But, you know, it was like for sex kids to go to college for like a minute, you know. <laughs> and they played on another song, too. They played on some other stuff. But we don't care about this. That's on my album, Red Cab to Manhattan. Yes, yeah. Which, by the way, Warner Brothers let die a miserable death. It, it, they didn't believe in it, and uh, they, they thought it was stunk, I think. And it, now it's considered this cult, you know, album. And I have these people who tell me it's their favorite album of mine. So go figure. How do you feel about it? Bitter. <laughs> no, how do you feel about Bitter the Bitter party album? of one, we have your table. <laughs> Bitter party of one. <laughs> um, how do I feel about it? Well, it's, you know, many years ago now, but, you know, that's, that's showbiz. Yeah. Well, one other uh, thing that I came across that was quite unusual, too, is you did a version of Monster Mash with Linda Ronstadt. Oh, pfft. <laughs> I'm, I was a little and curious Andrew about Gold. That. And Andrew Gold, the was, great Andrew Gold. Yeah, the yes. great Andrew Gold. Yeah. You know, we miss him big time. I, just, I loved loved him. We were great friends. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he wanted to do this monster match. And uh, I have a friend of mine named uh, Charlie Villers, and his father would sound like that. He would sound like, I was working in the lab late one night. Why my eyes to found a very weary sight, you know, and it was like yes, hello, you know. So I did it like that. Yeah, I don't know if this is that interesting, but 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 how did the idea of doing this come up in the first place? Because he asked me to do it. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Andrew. Andrew, Andrew didn't he? Yeah. Was just, yeah. I never even got any money for it. <laughs> um. So. Uh, you were in uh, um, 
you know, famously in one of the greatest scenes of in the history of film in Animal oh, House. Yeah, and, right. And <laughs> my thirty seconds of fame. <laughs> yes, but you made I, it count. I did. I did. I, I stole the film. I mean, it's, it's obvious. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that was me and Belushi there on the steps. But how did you get on the steps? That's how, how did you get into, how did you end up being Doing part it? of the film? Yeah. Uh, well, I had a friend back then named uh, John Landis, who was the director, and he directed Animal House. And he said, you've got to be in Animal House. And he also gave me the deal where I wrote this, the theme. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I wound up... Uh, you know, we wound up working out that scene because it wasn't in the script. So I came up with the song, you know, I gave my love a cherry <laughs> that had no stone. I gave my love a chicken. Didn't you ever give your love a chicken? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I sang that song and then he comes down and smashes it. He almost missed me. <laughs> I mean, I mean he, 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 he was like this far away from my head. No, no stunt double for that. No. 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 I actually, what's an interesting side note is the baseball commission out of nowhere, um, you know, got in touch with me and wanted to use that scene uh, in their stadiums across the United States and just show the scene to incite fans and get them all revved up, you know. And they gave me 800 bucks. <laughs> to, they, they, they allowed you to... to to uh, elicit hatred from the fans. That's so right. They're all over, yeah. Um, and and uh, that era of Los Angeles, of West Coast, when you were coming up, it, it seemed so glamorous and wild, and it's, you know, people were skiing down mountains of cocaine, if you believe the reports, you know, <laughs> things like that. Do you remember anything in particular from that that sort of sums up that like 70s era, that mid to 70s era, what it was like to live out there and be playing music and being involved in all the things that you were involved in? Well, it is a different vibe than it is now, that's for sure. I mean, you, know, you talk about cocaine, it was like flowing like Splenda. You know, it was like all over the place, you know. Uh, you know, I had a brief flirtation and then usually got sick. So I decided to, that this wasn't, you know, something I wanted to further on. And, and you know, it's really kind of, what no, no one ever talked about was, it was always cut with something, you know, and they, they would cut it with all sorts of things like LSD and speed and meth and, you, ugh, you know, it's just awful. You know, I, I, I get worried now just about eating Cheerios with Roundup in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that freaks me out. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm a different person these days. <laughs> um, what was the last song that you wrote? And what was it about? It was Almost Home. It was Almost Home. Yeah, I wrote it with a fellow named Kurt Sobel. Kurt Sobel is a good friend of mine, and he's in the movie business and stuff. And so we wrote it. Yeah, fabulous. So um, I'd like to take a couple questions from the audience. If anybody has something they'd like to ask uh, Stephen, it would be great. I'm going to come over with the mic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, a comment. Um, have always loved your music, and as a guitarist and a musician my whole life, I, I've always just been totally amazed at your voicings and the chords that you wrote for the songs that you did. Uh, they're absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. And they're, they're beyond um, folk type music or pop. They're, they're very, very uh, sophisticated. So I've always appreciated that. But I was always interested in, I think it's on your Bish album. Um, uh huh. So, um, I've been learning some of your pieces recently, and um, the one where you start with, uh, I only had a brain. Right, no, that's the beginning of the album. It's the beginning of the brain, the, the album, yes. And then later on, on Bish's Hideaway, you dedicate the song to Yip Harburg, who was one of my favorite lyricists. I was wondering what- It the, wasn't Bish's, Bish's Hideaway, it, it was, was uh, What Love Can Do, what I think. What Love Can Do? Yeah, that's uh, that weird one I wrote that's, you know, 
there's a princess in the shadows right. with a grapefruit for a face, right. you know, all that. So weird I was stuff. interested in the uh, uh, the commentary about Yip Harburg and how you got there. And, and oh, that's interesting. Well, I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I met Yip Harburg, and Yip Harburg is this uh, one of the great, great writers of all time. He wrote a little song called Over the Rainbow with Harold Arlen, and he wrote all the music and lyrics to uh, Wizard of Oz. You know, I mean, he's just amazing. And so I was very fortunate to, to hang with him and talk with him uh, towards the end of his career uh, then. Uh, and uh, it was a thrill, to be honest. And I never forget what he said to me. He said, you're not ever going to be a good songwriter unless you go to college. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd only been to like, you know, junior college or something, you know, for three months. So I was like, oh, no, I guess and that's it for me. <laughs> yeah, so much for that. <laughs> OK, we've got another one in the back over here. OK. Hi, hi Stephen, over here. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about how you broke into the scene? Because there's so many interesting stories about that. You know, people like just found themselves one day like swept up in something and I was just curious how that happened with you or if it was very different from that. You mean the start of my like, career? Yeah, exactly, like in your 20, early 20s or late teens, whatever. Well, I started very young. I started like 13. I was playing guitar, uh, you know. Uh, my brother got me a uh, electric guitar and uh, I he hooked it up to his, uh, record player and turned it into an amp and I my stepfather hated it you know and but I was I was playing around with guitar I couldn't I, I taught myself really I did get at one point in my career like you know I got the Mickey Baker jazz chord book and I thought wow you know this is great and then I was like getting all these chords and it really influenced me and, and my writing because uh, there's a lot you know I always want to make you know a song an, unusual and different and different chords and not your typical stuff, you know, so. Uh, oh, like meet Carol, I met Carol King. Um, I, I don't think she uh, really would say it's one of her cherished moments. Um, <laughs> I don't know if, it, you know, I got much attention from her, but she obviously is one of the greatest writers ever. Uh, her and, and her uh, then husband Jerry Goffin, um, but no, I mean, I, what is this like a magic? Hey, I, think or gonna, <laughs> I think we're going to take a question from somebody. No, it was somebody no. Else. This is okay. Uh, yeah. It was like uh, it's almost like uh, you know, it's not like a thing where it's like you magic like like fairy dust just goes up in the air and I'm a superstar. Uh, it's not going to be like that. But it, it, it's like hard work, to be honest. It was like years and years of trying to make it, you know, do, do, trying for this, trying for that. You know, it's, it's still hard sometimes. I mean, you know, but uh, I mean, it's hard probably, you know, it's hard just to be alive and, you know, for everybody. And, you know, life is hard. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my incredible Okay, we've got, we've got another question right here in the front. Okay. Hey, thanks. Uh, this is tremendous. Appreciate it. Huge fan. We're big fans of uh, It Might Be You. Can you tell us how you came to the project? I mean, Tootsie, well ahead of its time, and that movie's so old right now, and tremendous success on Broadway. I want to hear your experience. Oh, I I, it's on Broadway now, Yeah, right? it, won, it won a Tony. It won a couple of Tonys. It, and it stuff. already won a Tony? Well, nobody asked me to sing anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I did the theme, for, you know, but I didn't write it. It was written by Alan and Marilyn Bergman, great, incredible writers, and Dave Grusin, who's not, you know, no slouch. She's phenomenal. Um, they did a great job. And, you know, this song has followed me throughout my life. I mean, I did it, I, I sang it back in 83, and uh, it's, um, you know, of all things, you know, uh, the Philippines, they fell in love with the song. They fell deeply in love with this song. And boy, do they love it. Uh, they, they love romantic music and all that, but uh, It Might Be You is just, uh, I go over there, I've been there 11 times. I was just there last year. Yeah, I have a documentary about it. Uh, 
called, uh, um, we'll talk about it later in the car. <laughs> it's the <laughs> same, same thing. And uh, I wouldn't go over there for food choices because it's like, oh boy, some of their food is, whoa, experimental to say the least. Um, but, you know, um, I got a call uh, from my manager back then, Trudy Green, and she said, you know, um, they want you to sing this song for uh, this movie called Tootsie. So I went to the screening and I wound up uh, watching the first uh, version of it. Like it was like four and a half hours. It was before it was really edited. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, I, you know, it was all uh, music tempt by uh, Kenny Loggins. So, uh, you know, they, they were interested in me. So I wound up going to meet uh, Dave Grusin uh, at his office in Santa Monica. And he played me the song. And, he, you know, he played it. He was, he's a great musician, but I wouldn't say he's the greatest singer. So it was like, but it was obvious that this song is really good. And plus, they were offering me quite a lot of money. So, um, so anyway, so I did record the song, and um, you know, I, I mean, it's it's had such a history for me, and it's I, I get hit up by my friends to sing it at their weddings. I've already sung it at about thirteen or fourteen weddings. I even had to sing it at my own wedding, and I told my ex-wife. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to do it. I thought it was self-congratulatory. And she said, no, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. So I had to do it. It's like, oh, God. You know, it's weird because she got remarried just the other day, and I cried and cried all night for him. Uh, but <laughs> what? Sing her no, I didn't sing at her wedding, no. <laughs> anyway, so th does that answer your question? I mean, that's pretty good. OK, I think we're going to take one more. We have one more question. All right. Hey, right here. How you doing? Hi. So it's uh, it's easy to write a song when you're when you're heartbroken. Yeah. It's 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 simple, right? A little bit. Well, I wouldn't say it's simple. Well, it's I mean, hard. It's more. It's easier than. It's easier than not having your heart broken. My question is, how do you write uh, inspirational music when you're happy and content? Then you write. You know, happy and content, you know, like uh, Pharrell. I mean, he wrote, uh, because I'm happy, you know. <laughs> he was like, uh, Pharrell did just great, you know. He had, a, he had a hit all over the world, and, you know, and then on Spotify, he made like five bucks or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that it? I think that's it. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Stephen for for chatting with us. He's going to come back. And, I'm going to sing play a, couple a couple of, of songs uh, in, a, in a minute. I'm going to sing a, a couple of songs from the album. And uh, and thank you. And once again, the record. We'll talk about it in the car. Yep. Fantastic. Um, and I'll leave it to Stephen. Oh, okay. So I need a. But they're going to set up the mic. Yes. Well, we're going to be. We're going to leave the stage and come back in a couple minutes. All right. Thank you. I know a little bit about a lot of things But I don't know enough about you Just when I think you're mine You try a different line And baby, what can I do? You know I went to school And I'm nobody's fool that is to say, until I met you, I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I don't know enough about you. Jack of all trades, master of none, and isn't it a shame? only play my game I read the latest news no buttons on my shoes but baby I'm confused about you you get me in a spin oh what a stew I'm in cause I don't know enough about you I know a bit about biology 
psychology I'm a gem in geology But I don't know enough about you No, I don't know enough about you I don't know enough about you I don't Never pick the Miss America you think should win. And here in Paris, that's a million miles from Disneyland. And Chevalier said, Yes, I remember it well. Do you think he left out something that he wouldn't tell? took the metro underground down to Saint Germain. Saw Venus in blue jeans and stole my heart. And I get weird, then I get a little jealous. 
See the girls kiss on the same with their fellas. And I just want someone to hold me and never let me go. French postcards lying in a hallway. Lacy lady smile the label. Hey, everybody. So without uh, any further delay, we have Mr. Stephen Bishop up to play some great songs for us from his record. We'll talk about it later in the car. Thank you. So, well, thank you. <sighs> okay, so the first song I'm going to do is a, a song uh, which I, I was talking about, um, Almost Home. Um, I wrote it with this fellow named Kurt Sobel, and I'll do it for you now. It goes like this. If your heart believes in dreaming There's no other place I know Well, life it rolls on by Without a care for tomorrow Yeah, that was the life for me That was the life for me how long must I travel on this journey? Guess I'll count a million stars along the way. And every time I start to worry, something whispers in my ear. Says the words I long to hear Almost home Almost home Might be lost and afraid But I'm just a dream away I'm almost home Almost home might be cold and alone but i'm almost home just one more mile and i'll be home free just one more day is all my heart needs i'm gonna get there yeah i'm gonna get there someday almost home on my own might be lost and afraid but i'm gonna get there someday Almost home, almost home. Might be cold and alone, but I'm almost home. Thank you.
Thanks very much. Um, let's see. Uh, this is a. Uh, this is going to kind of go fast because I'm only doing three songs. But this this second song is a song called uh, "Someone Else," and this is the one I was talking about with Jimmy Webb, who wrote it when he was 12. And you hear this song and you go, God, it's so heartfelt, and I just love this song. So I, I had to do it. And it goes like this. It's someone else I've known it all the time Known that you're not mine And will never be It's someone else I saw you out last night Holding him so tight And it's someone else No, I really can't blame him For what's happening to me Will happen to him That's a certainty And he'll learn there's always someone else Like I learned myself Always someone else Always someone else I love that song. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I'll make sure to tell Jimmy Webb you, you, you clapped good. <laughs> uh, this last song is um, a song. Uh, I want to. Uh, by the way, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, this is my big release party, uh, so I'm pretty happy about this album coming out and. Uh, you know, I won't say it's my last hurrah, but it's it's one of them. <laughs> um, this is a song I wrote uh, called "Separate Lives." Uh, it was um, it was sung by Phil Collins and Marilyn Martin, and I was nominated for an Oscar uh, at the fabulous Academy Awards. I'm an Oscar nominee, ladies and gentlemen, and. Um, you know, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Uh, and uh, so, unfortunately, Lionel Richie won for his song, Say You, Say Me, Say I'm Gonna Steal Steve's Award. Uh, you might have heard that one. And uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it for you now. It's like a real song. It's like it happened, you know, the story is real and all that stuff, but it goes like this. <laughs> All full of romance for someone that you met Telling me how sorry you were leaving so soon And 
And that you miss me sometimes When you're alone in your room Do I feel lonely too? You have no right To ask me how I feel You have no right To speak to me so kind I can go on Holding on to ties Now that word Living separate lives. I held on to let you go, and if you lost your love for me, you never let it show. There was no way to compromise So now we're living separate lives Oh, it's so typical Love leads to isolation So you build that wall So you build that wall And you make it stronger You have no right To ask me how I feel You have no right to speak to me so kind Someday I might Find myself looking in your eyes But for now we'll go on living separate lives Yes, for now, we'll go on living separate lives. Oh, separate lives. Thanks so much. Come on, let's hear it. Stephen Bishop, the new record. We'll talk about it later in the car. Comes <laughs> out August 30th. Thank you.